Hello and welcome to the second lecture of week three. So last time we looked at Augustus part one, this is Augustus part two. We'll be looking at the last couple monuments of his rule in Rome. And then we're also going to be looking at the rest of the empire. So what was going on in other parts of the Mediterranean of the Roman world while he was emperor. So I want to start um, with a review as we've been doing. So this is um, a couple of works that we looked at last time, right? So the Augustus Prima Porta and uh, the Augustus as Pontifex Maximus. And in both cases, just to remind you, this should be a refresher. In both cases, we see Augustus as an idealized version of himself. He is also individualized, so he looks the same. He has very similar facial features. You're able to recognize him in both. And these are both idealized, but they're idealized in different ways. So on the right, um, we have Augustus as Pontifex Maximus, and he is looking very pious. He's a little bit skinnier. He has the uh, veil for uh, doing a sacrifice. He's about to preside over a religious ritual. So this shows him in his position as the highest priest of Rome. And he looks very serene. He looks, as I said, um, uh, somewhat graceful, I think, right? And uh, in the Augustus Prima Porta, on the other hand, we see him looking very militaristic, very strong. He's a confident leader here, the way that he has that arm outstretched. And again, uh, musculature that we don't necessarily see on the Pontifex Maximus. So they're both idealized. This is not how Augustus would have looked in real life, especially because both of these, he would have been much older than he looks. So definitely idealized. Um, but they're idealized in different ways. So I kind of wanted to make that point. The other point is that Augustus is using both of these works as propaganda, right? So as the emperor, as a politician, he is using these works to express something that he wants to say to the people about himself, about the Roman government, and about his rule. And so we have on the left, Augustus Prima Porta, a message of military strength, of Rome conquering other peoples, of expanding the empire, um, and of the strength of Augustus as a military leader. On the other hand, we have a more stable, uh, uh, a divinely inspired Augustus, one who was in touch with the gods, who has the gods on his side, because he, remember, he's the son of the divine Caesar. So we are seeing a, a depiction of him looking more in tune with the gods more uh, religious, right? Like, like he's the perfect divine son. So um, both idealized, but idealized in different ways. So we looked at portraiture. I wanna move now to some architecture that we see under Augustus. Um, so here we have a couple of maps of Rome um, and this, uh, and this quote, I think really uh, well sums up the way that um, that Augustus really built up the city of Rome. We see tons of construction works. Last time we looked at the forum, right? So that was, we started looking at some architecture. Um, and this time we're gonna look at some more because he really did a lot for the city. Um, and we have a historian who wrote about a century after his death, Augustus could justly boast that he found Rome built of brick, but left it made of marble. So he really elevated um, the construction of Rome, the buildings that we see there, and really turned it from um, a building or a city with a lot of sort of crumbling infrastructure, maybe, you know, some things were quite old at this point, needed some updating and updated a lot of things as well, made it nicer. So he really left his mark on the city. Um, and we saw that last time in the founding of his forum um, in, the, uh, in the center of town, right? So it was right next to the Roman forum that he built his own. Um, so a few more that we're going to look at today, and we're gonna start with a super important one um, right out the gate. Um, that really, if you know Roman art, or if you ever um, take another art course about that mentions Roman art, something like that, um, this is something that you'll almost for sure learn about. And this is the Ara Pacis. So the Ara Pacis Augusti means the altar of Augustan peace. It was begun in 13 BC and dedicated in 9 BC, so it took about four years to build. Um, it is made of marble, right, in line with that, that quote that we just saw, um, and it is located in Rome, and I think, in case you didn't see on the map, it's that red square, right? So here's the center of um, Rome, actually about right here, actually, well, yeah, we don't really see it because this is the capital end hill, so um, the center of Rome would be about right here, and so we see it on the outskirts, and we see it actually on a road. And that is the, um, the, which one is it? The Via Flaminia. The Via Flaminia 
So that is a, the main road which led north out of Rome. Um, and that's really important because in that position, it faced both the road, so it faced everyone who was entering or exiting the city on that road, but it also faced on its other side, part of the Campus Martius. And if you'll remember, that's the same kind of area that the theater of, of Pompey is in. The Campus Martius was also a training ground for the Roman military. So when they were not at battle, um, they would be there training. It's almost like one of our camps or bases that we have in the US. Um, I grew up right next to Camp Pendleton, which is down near Oceanside in Southern California. So I can, I can imagine sort of what this would be like. It's a training ground um, for the military while they're not uh, stationed elsewhere in the empire. And so in that way, it's facing both the military, who's very important, right? It's really important to have their support. You really want to be uh, exporting a good message to them, but it's also facing all of the people on that uh, road leading in and out of the city. So lots of visibility for this monument. Here is the monument again. Um, so I gave you a sneak peek at it. Um, it is an altar, which is not a piece of architecture that we've looked at before. It's a little bit different from um, a temple, right? So it's essentially just a box. <laughs> um, it's an altar surrounded by four walls. It's pretty square in shape. Um, you do see this, this sort of frontal axis. So we have this, this front staircase that's very common in Roman temples, front staircase leading up. And then we have these, these walls surrounding a central altar where the ritual would have been performed. So it's not a full temple. It's just um, an altar. But as you can see with the scale of the people in it, it's quite large. It almost feels like a, a piece of architecture, like a building. Um, let's begin with, um, oh yeah, that's right. Okay, so one thing that I did want to mention, like I mentioned with the um, uh, Augustus Prima Porta, is that it would have been painted originally. So remember, we see these as white marble, but back in the day they would have been painted and it would have been weird if they were not painted, it would have looked unfinished. Um, and so here are some, some depictions of what it could have looked like um, back in the day. In the Roman times, they have begun doing these really cool light shows where they'll, they'll actually project what it could have looked like onto the building itself. So um, you can kind of see it in the real space, which is cool. So that's what we're seeing down here. They did a light show um, that people could have attended. Um, really cool. And they've done that with a lot of buildings. So I'll see if I can find more pictures as the, as the class goes on of, of events like that. Um, yeah, so to start with the inside, so this is what the inside of it would have looked like. Um, and, you know, you're kind of peeking through the doorway here. Um, something, uh, it's pretty bare, you might notice. Um, there wasn't a lot to it, which means the emphasis was supposed to be on the ritual, right? So you don't need to look all around at the paintings because that's where the event is taking place, is right there on the altar. So let's look at the decoration that we do see, right? So there are some uh, garlands that we see hanging on the walls and these garlands are very ornate, very lavish. Um, they're very vegetal. So we see a lot of fruit hanging off of them. We see these ribbons kind of swaying in the wind maybe um, coming off of them also. Linking up each garland is a cow skull. So you see a cow skull right there and then a garland and then there's another one right there. Um, you can see it here as well. And then in the center, we have a sort of bowl. So this would actually be um, a libation bowl. So that's uh, referencing the ritual that's taking place on the altar in the center there. We have this sort of ritualistic imagery. Uh, and the, the, one of the biggest takeaways or something that maybe you've already noticed, the emphasis on vegetation which mimics on a Corinthian temple, we also see a lot of, a lot of vegetal decoration, right? So this, uh, this mimicking of the Corinthian order in something that's not quite a temple, but is a religious building in a way, um, they're sort of hinting at that Corinthian order. We also see idealization. So we talked about idealization in portraiture, but we can also see it in things like the depiction of, of nature um, and that this is just over the top beautiful, perfect, right? It's almost too perfect. Um, and that, that you, this is such a lush uh, garland that we're seeing here. Um, it doesn't really look real in a way. It's almost too perfect. So we're seeing this, this manipulation of reality in the name of, of beauty, right? And of decoration. Um, so if we continue, so this is a vegetal motif that we see here. And then if we continue, we see on the outside of it as well, we see this, this motif continuing where we have lots of vegetal designs, again, mimicking that Corinthian order. We even see acanthus leaves um, in, in this sort of design um, here. You'll also notice that the outside is split into two registers. So on the bottom, we have 
in that bottom register, we have really vegetal designs. It almost looks like a garden. It's kind of um, a little bit more abstract. So it's not necessarily supposed to be like a scene or, or a narrative scene. It's just this, this vegetal decoration. And then we have human figures up top. And so again, we see idealization here, um, manipulation in the name of beauty. So <laughs> um, one, of these, uh, one of the things to note is that there are grapes here and, and these acanthus leaves and it's sort of a manipulation of reality because grapes don't grow on acanthus leaves but they're sort of coming out of the vine here. So we're seeing this pursuit of, of really lavish over the top um, beauty. Um, and another thing to note is the idea of, of bounty here that we have um, references to the harvest, to uh, great, a great uh, bounty of, of grapes, of plants, very lush. Uh, nothing is dead, nothing is dying, right? This is a thriving scene. And it's perhaps to mimic the, the thriving that is happening in the empire. And that is really important because as I said, this is the era Pacis Augusti, the altar of Augustan peace. And this monument was created as a peace monument, as a celebration of peace. So uh, when Augustus was on a military campaign, he went out to Spain and to Gaul um, and conducted military campaigns there. And when he came back victorious, um, the Senate uh, offered him this, this, uh, this, to build this basically in his honor because um, I, we mentioned the, the Pax Romana that Augustus had, had ushered in, right? So if we look at the historical context, we see lots of civil war, lots of turmoil with Julius Caesar, and then with, with uh, Octavian at the time, Octavian versus Mark Antony we see. Um, and now when Augustus takes power, things are suddenly uh, more peaceful, more stable. We also see that he's going out and conquering people. Remember, he, he brings uh, Egypt into the empire as well. So we see a time of stability and we call this, uh, this specifically, I guess, could be the, the Pax Augusta. Um, but we also see the Pax Romana, which is actually going to be a 200 year long period where we see overall general Roman peace, peace in the Roman Empire. So this monument, this altar of Augustan peace is a manifestation of that, of that stability. And uh, as I said before, it's mounted right on the main road. Uh, it's also facing the military. So it's reminders to everyone in the empire of what Augustus has done, of the fact that he has brought peace uh, and stability to the empire. And we're going to see that really explicitly in the top register where we see uh, figures. So that's hinted at here when we look at the, the vegetal designs, this idea of bounty, of, of a good harvest, of everything teeming with life, but we're going to see it even more explicitly in the figures that they chose to depict on this altar. So we'll go kind of side by side here, right? And so we're gonna start with the east facade, uh, which would have actually been the back of it because you can't see those steps, right? So um, this is the back of it uh, to look a little bit closer. So if we're looking right here, right? This one's kind of been lost. We'll talk about it briefly, but I really wanna focus on this one. So this, uh, this panel from the east facade in that upper register um, is, is very telling of the, the piece that and the peace of, and prosperity that Augustus has brought to this empire. So in the center, we see the figure of Tellus, who you may remember was also on the Augustus Prima Porta. So she was that lower figure on the Augustus Prima Porta who's holding fruit. And then I said, she's also holding Romulus and Remus. And that's what we see here. So very similar iconography. We see this woman in the center who's holding these two babies, one of whom is offering her fruit. And we see lots of other vegetal designs. We see animals like farm animals at the bottom. It's a very peaceful, very maternal scene. Uh, Tellus as, she's essentially Mother Earth. <laughs> um, she is a symbol of fertility, of, of life, right? The fact that everything around her is growing, that babies are being born. This is a very harmonious scene. It's a very um, peaceful and prosperous scene. You know, again, speaking to the idea of bounty, um, of, of, of good times really, right? This is not a war scene. Um, we don't have a, a, a strife in this picture. Everything feels very calm. And then she's flanked by these two figures, these two female figures who are also implied that they are sort of uh, divinity types and kind of like her handmaidens. They are the winds of the earth and the winds of the sea. So we have personifications of these, these ideas, um, the winds of the earth and the winds of the sea 
again, very natural imagery. So we're seeing a lot of vegetation um, and especially in her role as sort of mother earth, right? And then also speaking to the fact that we have Romulus and Remus here, we're making a, a reference to um, the founding of Rome. And I remember, I think I mentioned this idea of a rebirth under Augustus, that Rome was born again, um, that it sort of had new life under Augustus. And so we're seeing a lot of references to tradition and, um, and the founding myths as well, though. Um, and the fact also that babies are a symbol of life, of continued prosperity, right? If you have children, then that means that your line continues, your, your country, you know, your empire continues if you have babies. And we actually see um, that happening in the policies. So Augustus was very concerned about the birth rate in the empire at this time. And he actually put into place incentives that for people to have more children because he was worried about the future of Rome. And so these ideas, again, of um, fertility linked with prosperity, um, we really see that represented here. On the other side, I know I said that it's hard to see. So this is possibly Roma. There's very little left and they have tried to reconstruct what maybe it, it looked like with the very little evidence that we have, but they think it might be a personification of Roma who was, um, or a personification of Rome, which we call Roma. She was this goddess um, who is a personification of the city. So um, she's sort of the patron of Rome, you could say the patroness of Rome. Um, and we see her here, she maybe was wearing battle regalia. So it perhaps is a reference to uh, Rome's military strength, but the fact that she looks calm at peace, right? It's, it's a sign that she's not fighting anymore. She's not, she's not still undertaking wars, but instead she's, she's calm and at peace. So um, again, that's more conjecture because we are not really sure how much is left, but that's a possible idea. So we have these two female goddesses on the east facade. And then if we move to the west facade, we see images of the founders of Rome again. So this time we see the discovery of Romulus and Remus. So um, we see, uh, I think it's the maybe the shepherd here, and we also maybe see a soldier, um, but they may have been in a scene with Romulus and Remus referencing um, the, the the founding of Rome again. Um, and then the more well-preserved side is the, the, the right side. So the doorway would be in the middle and between these two, this is on your left and that's on your right. So on the right, we see a, the scene of uh, the sacrifice of Aeneas. And uh, this is uh, depicting a scene from uh, the Aeneid, which was written by Virgil during the reign of Augustus and detailed the, the adventures of Aeneas who I think I mentioned before, right? He was that hero from the Trojan War um, and he, he is sent out on his own and he eventually uh, through many trials and tribulations comes to Italy. He founds um, a settlement in, in Italy that would eventually uh, uh, birth Romulus and Remus and then they would go off to form Rome. So it's kind of interesting. We have this, this dual, dual founding myths here but the Romans kind of tried to make it work where they said Aeneas was maybe an ancestor of Romulus and Remus. Yeah. Um, but anyway, in this one, we see um, a, a famous event that happens in Virgil's uh, the, uh, Aeneid. Um, in book eight of the poem, Aeneas is told in a dream that he will find a white uh, sow, a white pig, and by sacrificing her and, his, and her litter, he will ensure the founding of Rome. So we see that pig there, um, and he is, he's, uh, uh, enacting this, this sacrifice about to about to do this, which will lead to the, the founding of Rome, right? Um, pigs were also a sign of prosperity in, in Rome. So there's also sort of a dual, a dual meaning there. So um, lots of, of references to, uh, to founding as well. Um, and something else that I wanted to mention is that if we look at their drapery on their clothing, it looks very Greek. So we see these deep folds looks very classical, um, you know, this man has a beard, um, very classical forms in the outfits that they're wearing and the style of the drapery. And um, if we go back, very Greek, right? Very, that wet drapery that we see on the Parthenon. So if you'll remember when I was showing you uh, the reclining Aphrodite, it uh, looks almost identical the way that she um, is, is clothed with that, that wet drapery that sticks to her body and you can see the form of her body underneath her clothing and those deep folds and ornate folds, um, especially also in the, uh, the sort of, I don't even know what you'd call that sail almost that they have above them. Um, these, uh, if 
really ornate as well, and really in a, in a classicizing style, in a Greek uh, style of drapery. So let's move forward to the sides. So again, yeah, there's there's Telus. There's our Telus panel in the upper relief or upper um, register, although it is a relief image also. Um, and then we see this sort of abstracted shape um, uh, of uh, design here, and then these vegetal designs that go all the way up, um, even on these pilasters as well. And there we actually have. There you go. We have Corinthian capitals that we see on these pilasters. So um, now we're going to look at the sides of the monument. And what we see here is a processional frieze, essentially. So what we see is many people, tons of people, um, all of these figures that some of them don't even have bodies. <laughs> They're almost just standing behind people. And so we have different relief here. We have some in low relief, which means they're really shallow. They're really um, just next to the wall. And then we have some in high relief that are, that are brought out more toward the viewer that are um, expanded like that. Um, and if you can see from this image, you can just see how many figures there are. This is a massive parade, a massive procession of people. There's a lot of debate about what this procession means, about where they are going. Um, it's, it's theorized that perhaps this is a picture of the dedication ceremony of this monument. And um, you know, this would have been a day when a lot of people came out for the, for the opening of this monument. So it could have been that. Um, but in any sense, it is certainly a depiction of the imperial family. And it's, uh, some of it is lost, but it's theorized that Augustus is this figure. So this, he's mostly lost, but his face uh, sort of matches the other depictions of Augustus we have. So that might be Augustus and he is leading his family. And we see a lot of familiar characters in this procession. And as I said many times now, <laughs> um, individualized portraits were really big. So the fact that we um, have other portraits and we see resemblances, we can, we can pick out people who we recognize um, because of this individualization. So um, here we have some of his family members. Two of the most prominent are Marcus Agrippa and Livia. So Marcus Agrippa was kind of uh, Augustus's right-hand man, though in the same way that Mark Antony maybe was for Julius Caesar. Uh, Marcus Agrippa kind of takes that role for, for Augustus. He's one of his best generals and, and, uh, and friends, honestly. And so we see him in this depiction of the family. And then Livia, if you'll remember, that's Augustus's wife. Um, and we think that that might be Livia there. Um, and so again, people that we know, um, we can identify this as people who were close to Augustus, to, to the emperor. Um, we also see uh, in this procession of the imperial family, we see people acting very natural. So it's, um, it's idealized for sure because these are very perfect looking figures. Um, we don't see a lot of flaws on them, um, especially in that drapery, the way that it's, it's very dramatic, classical drapery, very Greek influenced. Um, but we also see some measure of, um, of candidness, right? That these people look candid. It looks like when you we take a picture and people are talking to each other, they don't realize you're taking the picture. Um, we even have children, right? So children are depicted here and the children are kind of looking at each other, speaking to each other. Um, and, and the children are important because as I said earlier, like with the babies, they are showing the future of Rome, right? They're showing that this, this imperial family, right? With all these people who are close to Augustus, um, that there are children and that this, this, this dynasty is almost going to continue that that Augustus has a legacy that he has children who will and it's implied will take the his spot after him. Um, his none of his biological children unfortunately live long enough for that to happen. Um, and the children that we see here, who we infer are his children, um, unfortunately these children don't live to adulthood. But the idea that he had was that his children would succeed him and that they would continue this this dynasty, this this empire that he has founded. And so again, speaking to the idea of peace, right? Um, and it's it's interesting how it mirrors, you know, what's going on in our country right now. Um, we talk a lot about the peaceful transition of power, right? That's sort of what he's implying here. But there's not going to be a civil war when he dies, right? Because we have children who are going to take his place. And so he's reminding people of that on an altar of Augustan peace. There's an implication that the Augustan peace will continue even after his own life, even after Augustus is gone, the Augustan peace will remain. Um, an interesting, <laughs> interesting comparison that I noticed, you know, um, is that if this is sort of they're processing to the, the opening of this building, 
um, just especially, I, I couldn't help but notice this, right, similarities of things that happen today. So this was the inauguration, um, you know, just yesterday, but we see uh, uh, similar things happening even today where when a big event is happening, politicians bring their families, right? Um, it's a whole family affair. Um, and you see these, these, these people who you recognize, right? Um, and uh, we see it also, right, with them bringing the children. So the children are brought to these events as well. Um, and it sort of rounds out the family. So um, interesting just comparison, I think, to see the similarities of um, political events and political families that um, we see even today. Um, another reference that this is making is to the Parthenon. So I mentioned how the drapery is referencing the Parthenon, right? But there is also on the Parthenon this giant pr processional frieze uh, which people think uh, depicts a procession up the Panathenaic Way to uh, the Parthenon for a special ritual that happens um, where the, the goddess in the Parthenon gets a, a new peplos, she gets a new dress kind of. Um, and so we see that um, same thing where these the people are all kind of blending into each other. So there's some in the background and some in the foreground, but their their heads are all at the same height. Um, and so it's sort of hard to distinguish who is who, whose body belongs to which head, right? Um, but again, this might be a reference to uh, to Greece. You know, we, we have seen over and over again how the Romans uh, liked mirroring uh, Greek culture or Greek imagery, um, especially now that they have taken over Greece and are the, the, the new power, um, you know, that Greece once was in, in the distant past. Something else we see are the inclusion of priests. So there is um, uh, uh, Augustus's family, right? We see Augustus's family and you'll notice this is the same uh, part of the picture is the same. Uh, there's Marcus Agrippa and Livia again. Um, but we also see lots of priests here, which makes sense. This is a religious monument and perhaps they're going to a religious ceremony. Um, and so anyone with a funny hat that you see <laughs> is, a, is a priest. Um, and also the people that we see, right, with the veils over their heads, like the um, Augustus says, uh, uh, Pontifex Maximus, that that status, that statue that we looked at, had the the veil over his head as someone who was about to conduct a ritual. We see that here as well. Um, and if you look closely, we also see a child here, and that child is actually not a Roman child. So earlier we looked at uh, the children as the continued legacy of Augustus, his own children, right? Um, this was one of them there, and you can see he's dressed in a, a Roman fashion. Um, he even sort of has a fibula. Remember we talked about that way uh, in the beginning. Um, and his hair is cropped as well. So this is a Roman child. This, however, is a barbarian child. So this is not a Roman, right? This is someone who would have been from a tribe that the Romans had conquered. This was very common when the Romans would conquer another people. They would often take children as a sort of tribute as a way to uh, uh, show their dominance. And they would take these children back to Rome and they would actually raise them, um, you know, sometimes as part of prominent families. Um, there's, a, <laughs> there's a show on Netflix right now called Barbarians. It's a German show, uh, but it talks about exactly that where they're, the Romans came into to Germany and took a child, um, a couple of children from this German tribe back to Rome and he was raised as a Roman and then he gets sent to uh, Germany again to, to be there as a Roman soldier. And there's a lot of conflict um, between his, uh, his loyalties, right? And that's actually a real event that happened um, that that show on Netflix is, is uh, depicting. So the, the Battle of the, the Teutoburg Forest um, was, I won't get into it, but it's, uh, uh, it hinges on this, this person who was raised in Rome. Um, but they are actually German at heart. So that's what we see here. We see a similar barbarian child um, and you can tell they are a barbarian because they are dressed very differently. So they have a different outfit on that sort of tunic um, is not quite Roman. It's a little bit uh, from a different culture. And then we also see a uh, longer hair, right? So the Romans liked their short hair. We see long hair on this child. Um, and perhaps most of all, we see this necklace which is called a torque. And that torque um, would have looked like this. So here's one that we have in the British Museum. And this was common for tribes in Northern Europe. So this might be a, a Gallic child, a Celtic child, something like that. Um, this is what that necklace would have looked like. And that was a common necklace in their, their culture. So that, that piece of iconography is really marking him as an outsider. He is not Roman. Um, and that again is showing Roman dominance, the fact that they have conquered people, the fact that they are no longer in war because they have conquered other people and um, are now in control of this massive empire. So that is uh, the altar of Augustine peace. And just 
Um, I want to hammer that home again. This is an, a, a piece of propaganda, right? This is Augustus trying to convey a certain message about his rulership and about his empire, the inclusion of himself, of his family members. This is not just a Roman monument, it is an Augustan monument. It is not just the monument, uh, the altar of peace, it is the altar of Augustan peace, and that Augustus is to be credited with bringing this peace to the empire. So the fact that we have bounty, we have this, this uh, lush vegetation, everything is teeming with life, we have fertility, babies are being born, um, we have people being, uh, you know, uh, enemies being conquered, right? Um, we have references to the founding myths. It's an appeal to people's patriotism, right? This, if you look at this and you were a Roman, you should feel proud to be Roman and you should feel very proud that Augustus is your emperor, right? Because Augustus is the one who brought you such a great life. So definitely a piece of, of propaganda here um, and a very Augustus-centric one. I wanna to move to another monument of his, which is um, very much a personal monument because this is his mausoleum. So uh, in the Roman world, you would make preparations for your own death. Um, and so, especially if you were from the upper class, you would build yourself even a, a mausoleum uh, that you knew you would be buried in. So this is the mausoleum of Augustus. So it started in 28 BC, <laughs> he doesn't die until 14 CE. So he uh, was really thinking ahead we see that it's somewhat nearby the Arapacus. So it's off that same road, the, uh, the via, the North Via here. And then uh, the Arapacus is here and the mausoleum is here. Here's a better, a few better views of it. So um, it would have been, there's not much left of it today. So this is, you know, the foundations that we have. We think it was likely a very tall monument, um, quite grand. Uh, there are, these are all different options of how it could have looked. So we have a lot of different depictions um, of how it could have looked. But something that it has in common that you may have already picked up on is that it is this beehive shape. It sort of looks like the tumulus tombs that we see in uh, Etruscan necropoli, right? So that, uh, that, that shape is referencing a very italic form, um, less Greek influence and more italic influence, again, referencing the traditions of Rome, right? So um, on the last one, we saw a reference to the founders, right? Romulus and Remus and Aeneas. And here we see a reference to our Etruscan, you know, siblings um, and our, our ancient past as Romans. A couple of things to note here. This is also a mausoleum for his whole family. So he would not have just been buried here, but the whole family would have. So um, again, that family idea was very important to him. Um, uh, uh, linked to the idea of dynasty, right? That it's not just him, it's the whole family that's important. Um, and we also see that the wood that uh, something that would have been displayed here as his his tomb, right? So this is his tomb. Um, we see the res gestae displayed here. So the res gestae divi Augusti is the deeds of the deified Augustus. Um, and we say it dates to 14 CE because that's the year he died, but it was uh, continuously written and updated throughout his life. And this is the achievements of Augustus. So um, it's, it's essentially his, his bragging sheet. He is able to, to tell the public all of the great things that he did for them throughout, the, uh, his, throughout his reign. So on the Arapacus, we see a sort of hinting at that with this fertility, bounty, um, lush vegetal designs, harvest motif. Here, he is literally telling you what he did for you. <laughs> so there is no mistaking it. And like everything else that Augustus builds, it is heavy propaganda. Um, it is definitely a twisting of the truth or a, a rephrasing of certain events. So when he talks about um, uh, 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 Mark Antony, he talks about uh, it as a faction. Oh, he just defeated a faction. It wasn't someone who was also a rival for the throne you know, that could have beat him and become emperor. It was just, just this faction, right? Um, when he had extinguished the flames of civil war. So he's kind of implying, oh, I didn't cause the civil war. No, 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 no. I just extinct, they were already happening and then I extinguished the flames, right? Um, and also he really, really emphasizes that he did not take this power by force, okay? It was just given to him. For this service, I was given the title of Augustus by decree of the Senate, I I didn't ask for it. No, they just gave it to me, right? So, um, lots of lots of propaganda here, and uh, uh, he's definitely telling the people 
um, how to think about his rule and what to think um, about the, the way in which he became the first emperor. Um, but these you would have seen all over the empire and actually the biggest amount of them that we have, um, let's see, do I have it here? Yeah. So we actually from Turkey, we find a lot of these still surviving in Turkey um, because they would have been erected in towns, right? So even though you're very far from the empire, you are getting a list of the accomplishments of the emperor and you can look at it every day on your walk to the forum and think about how great Augustus is. <laughs> um, and so this is a surviving copy that we have um, inscribed after 14 CE. So that's after his death, right? So this is a, a summation of his life. And this would have also been displayed, as I said, at his mausoleum um, as, as almost a sort of tombstone in a way, uh, depicting his, his accomplishments. Um, so something else that we see at, uh, actually, I'm gonna go back so you can see it. So something else that you see at the mausoleum of Augustus, this is a sort of crude depiction of it, but um, two obelisks would have stood in the, in the front and we have the, the foundations of those today, I believe. Um, and that is because, if you'll remember, uh, Augustus, when he was uh, uh, fighting Mark Antony, and when he defeats Mark Antony, he takes control of Egypt, and Egypt is now part of the Roman Empire. So what happens is we start seeing a sort of uh, uh, fascination with Egypt and an inclusion of a lot of Egyptian forms in Roman art and in the Roman world, and some of those are quite literal and that he literally takes um, things from Egypt and brings them to Rome. Um, so some of those are obelisks. So that's what we see here. This is the obelisk of uh, Montecitorio, originally from Heliopolis, Egypt. Um, and Augustus brought it to Rome, um, dedicated in 10 BC. And this is a really interesting uh, monument for so many reasons. First of all, the fact that it is an ancient obelisk. So um, I'm not sure of the exact date, but it would have been much longer ago. This was a monument in Egypt. Uh, he brings it to Rome and he creates a sundial, essentially, called the Horologium Augusti, uh, which is basically a, a giant sundial. And this is used as the gnomon. So that is the sort of indicator. If you can picture a sundial, right? It's like a circle and then it has that line and that's like the shadows that come in. So the obelisk itself is that indicator on the sundial. Um, so it's like a, a massive, you know, a sundial on a massive scale. Um, this also, as you can see on the map, would have been near the Arapacus and near the Mausoleum, so, um, and near the Via Flaminia. So he's making this sort of uh, uh, Augustine <laughs> area right on that, that frequently visited uh, route in and out of the city. Um, and so just to, yeah, I'm gonna read the quote to tell you a little bit how it works, um, which is from Pliny the Elder, who is a, a historian writing um, in the, the century after Augustus. Um, so a pavement was laid down for a distance appropriate to the height of the obelisk so that the shadow cast at noon on the shortest day of the year might exactly coincide with it. Augustus placed on the pinnacle a gilt ball, which you can see there, at the top of which the shadow would be concentrated for otherwise the shadow cast by the tip of the obelisk would have lacked definition. So they really put thought into this. This was almost an engineering feat because they had to figure out how exactly to position it. Um, but definitely a, a heavy reference to Egypt here. Um, and uh, you can see here its communication with other monuments in, in the way that it would point to these different monuments of Augustus. So um, again, really an aggrandizing feat for Augustus, um, referencing his own power, referencing um, his, his, his power in Rome, but also in Egypt, and also sort of this this idea of connecting with the heavens too, right? I think there might be some kind of religious significance here because um, you know the, the, the gods are related to the heavens, right? And so the fact that we have the sun coming down and the shadow hitting it um, seems like it creates an almost divine atmosphere here. So um, just sort of an interesting thing that he does. Um, another thing that happens is we start seeing um, people also becoming interested in Egypt. So people who are not Augustus, just people who are um, in the Roman Empire. So <laughs> one of these is the Pyramid of uh, Cestius. So um, it's, uh, it was not created by Augustus. Uh, it was a, a tomb of someone in the city and he chose for it to look like a, a pyramid. So <laughs> um, you can see it's also sort of uh, abutted by this wall. So it was um, on the wall of the city, I believe. 
Um, and yeah, again, a huge reference to Egypt and the pyramids, right? So we're starting to see a more um, multicultural or uh, different influences in the Roman Empire um, from these places that they have conquered. Something else if we move outside of Rome. So um, as I said, we're gonna look at the, the empire under Augustus a bit, right? So um, we're gonna move to France. Uh, if you'll remember, Julius Caesar was the one who conquered Gaul, finally. Um, many had tried, but Julius Caesar finally got the job done and brought the region of modern day France under Roman control. Um, and this was one of the provinces that was set up in, uh, in France um, and uh, uh, yeah, so the, the province is Gallia Narbonensis, Narbonensis, and then the city in that is Guanum. So that's that's what's going on there. Guanum is the city, and then that's the province. Um, so this is an this is a, uh, a monument that we see erected there. Um, this is the Mausoleum of the Julii, which is a family name. So it was a prominent family who lived in Glanum. Um, it was likely the tomb of the mother and uh, father of the three Julii brothers. Um, and the father likely was a, uh, a military a commander in the Roman army. So um, he was probably uh, Gallic, Gallic by birth, but then joined the Roman army um, and actually did so well and proved his loyalty that he received Roman citizenship. So um, he, he adopts the name Julii, um, which is a, a Roman name um, and a reference to, to distinguished members of the, the Roman world. So um, this is a, a quite lavish uh, mausoleum. You can tell it's, it's for someone important, right, by the height, um, the different things that we have going on here. So it's built in three stages. Um, we have a sort of tholos at the top, this, this circular area, right? And, and then down here, we have um, a sort of triumphal arch. So uh, usually it's just the one side, but here we have made kind of a cube out of the triumphal arch. Um, it almost resembles a temple in a way, but um, because this was a military commander, it is likely a, um, a, a triumphal arch celebrating his military accomplishments, right? Um, and then we see at the, the bottom, we see that relief, um, that frieze that goes all the way along the bottom. Um, there's a lot going on here, um, but we see a lot of scenes of myth. So we see scenes from the Trojan War, from the Amazonomachy, which is the, the battle of the ancient Greeks against the Amazons. So lots of references to warfare, to military, definitely for someone who is a military commander, um, and also a lot of, well, entirely Roman imagery. So although the person who was buried here was born in Gaul, was technically Gallic, um, he has adopted a Roman identity, and um, he has earned this Roman identity through his military service. So um, we see that sort of ability, like that child who was taken, right? Um, we see the ability to move up in the Roman army, even if you are not Roman born. Um, but something we also see in Glanum is this actual triumphal arch, um, which was uh, likely erected by, if not Augustus, the, the government, the kind of governing governor there. Um, it is a triumphal arch and it's likely celebrating the, um, the uh, uh, conquest of Gaul by Julius Caesar and um, it's you know erected under Augustus's reign, um, but celebrating that triumph. And there's a lot of imagery on it um, where you can see like subjugated enemies, subjugated Gauls. So um, although they, they offer uh, the ability to be incorporated into Roman society, we also see uh, a show of power, a show of uh, sort of aggressive conquest and that they're reminding people we have conquered you, right? We are showing you all subjugated. Um, you know, they're like, uh, uh, there's, there's prisoners in, 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 you know, looking like they're captives um, and they're dressed like Gauls. So we definitely see um, a reminder of Roman power and of the, the fact that the Romans have conquered this place, um, erected in the very place and, and showing sort of the same people who would have been viewing it living in that town. Um, so definitely, uh, a show of, of Roman power. Again, you know, the, the Pax Augusta um, is this sort of the other side of it, right? For the Romans, it was a time of great peace and prosperity, um, but for so many others, it was a time of subjugation, right? Um, even if there were a few who could rise up um, into, into higher ranks, uh, still definitely um, many under Roman control. So that uh, sort of rounds out where we're going with Augustus. That sort of is, is going to finish us off 
Um, this is really our last building actually though of Augustus. Um, and it's also uh, uniquely situated because it's, it's a, the perfect bridge between our week of Augustus and the beginning of our next week, which is going to be on Pompeii. Um, and we have again, a whole week for Pompeii like we did for Augustus. So this is the building of Eumachia. It is in Pompeii. It was built after seven BC. So under the reign of Augustus. And um, essentially uh, what happened here is that Olivia set up a cult. So Olivia, Augustus's wife, set up a cult of Augustus um, in Pompeii. Uh, it was bad form, right, to set one up for yourself. So, so Livia gets the credit here, right, because Augustus, um, as I've said many times, he likes to hint at the fact that he might be a god, but he doesn't say it outright. So again, if other people want to think that, I'm not going to correct them. And if, if my wife wants to set up a cult for me, like, okay, but I'm not doing it. So that's not, not sacrilegious, right? <laughs> um, so Olivia sets this up for him. Um, and it was, if it was outside Rome also, that's sort of also makes it better, right? Because it's like, oh, well, it's not right in the heart of the empire in the, the religious capital also. Um, it's, it's out in Pompeii, so that's fine. Um, and uh, people would make sacrifices for the, for the well-being of Augustus. Um, it was like his, it was kind of like a fan club on, on steroids. <laughs> so it was, it was these people who really worshiped Augustus in his lifetime. So, right, this is not him being deified after death. This is him in his lifetime, people admiring him and almost worshiping him so much. Um, so we see this statue of a priestess. Um, this is likely Eumachia herself, who was a, a, a big priestess in the city. Um, she uh, was sort of a matron of the city. Also, this building, we call it the building of Eumachia because it was dedicated in her honor after her death because she was this, this matron, this great matron of the city, very wealthy. Um, so it was probably dedicated after her death in her honor. And we see this statue of her in the city or in the building. She is dressed, um, as we've seen, in the very traditional uh, religious priest attire. So we see her with the veil over her head, preparing for a sacrifice in these very long robes. Um, also looks very classical. You know, she has the, the contrapposto. You can see some of the form of her body under that, that drapery with so many folds in it, especially when we get to the bottom here. Um, you know, very ornate the number of deep folds. Again, this sort of um, hanging part uh, which looks like it could be blown in the wind or something. So um, we have our, our statue of Eumachia and then we have the building itself. So um, the statue where she would have stood, um, yes, at the back here, in the back of kind of like the sanctuary in a way almost. Um, so there was a niche where, where this statue was found. Um, the building itself kind of uh, resembles a basilica in a way. So it's, uh, it's rectangular and then it has an apse at one end. Um, and then it would have had uh, niches, other niches for other statues. Um, it also, uh, if we see in the front, right, so there's this marble frame, um, there's a decorative frieze in the marble, again with vegetation, we see more vegetation uh, on in, you know, throughout the empire. Um, but this uh, perhaps may be a replication of the Arapacus or a reference to that um, in the, the vegetal designs that we see, because we saw that on the Pacus, right, we saw that on on the Arapacus on the um, uh, surrounding the doorway and sort of in those those pilaster column type things. Um, lots of vegetal designs. So we see that here too. It looks like brick now, but it would have been faced with stone, um, some kind of stone like marble or travertine. So it would have looked this like white material, uh, gleaming white all the way around. It would not have, you wouldn't have seen the brick that we see now. Um, what else? It also would have held statues of Romulus and Aeneas, founders of Rome, people that Augustus uh, really admired, felt close to. Uh, the inscription is the reason that we know it is a building to Augustus because um, it has, uh, the inscription talks about having pious devotion to Augustus. Um, and so it uh, looks similar to a, a civic basilica, which I think maybe I've mentioned is um, a very administrative type building, sort of a, a, where civic functions would take place. It looks similar to that in its design, but it is not a basilica. It's actually not even an imperial building. It's a private building um, that these people erected, as I said, in her honor. Um, but because she was a priestess of kind of this cult of Augustus, the whole building is also dedicated to Augustus. Um, so uh, an interesting uh, building outside of Rome, but built in Augustus's honor. Um, the fact that he used so much propaganda to promote himself uh, 
it seemed to have worked, right? Because he gathered a large following. Um, we have people who are worshiping him in his lifetime, essentially. So this, this propaganda must have worked, right? Because the uh, perception that people had of him ended up matching what he was trying to say about himself. And, you know, we've talked a lot about um, the fact that he thought, or hinted at the fact that he was a god, and we will see that uh, after his death, he is deified, and he becomes the divine Augustus, um, and we'll start seeing even more temples dedicated to him after his death, once it's kind of safe to do so, because it's like, oh, now he's died, so like, he's, okay, we, we're allowed to say he's a god now, right? Um, so we'll see that across the empire as well. Um, so that's where I'm going to leave it, because as I said, this is a great bridge, so we talked about Augustus this week, we talked a lot about the imperial side of things, about the political side of Rome. And I'm very excited for next week because we're going to start looking more at the, the people of Rome and what normal people in Rome, how they would have lived, how they would have worked, how they would have eaten, drank, um, all these different things, right? And we're going to do that by looking at Pompeii, which is perhaps the, the best preserved, it is the best preserved Roman city that we have. We're going to talk about the eruption. We're going to talk about all of the types of architecture that we see there. And in doing so, we're going to talk about the, the basic Roman city layout and uh, Roman houses as well. So it's all about the people next week. We talked about all, all about the emperor this week, and it's all about the people next week. So see you there. Thanks so much.